Good evening, I'm Helen Arcantu, CEO of the YWCA of Northern New Jersey, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Thank you for joining me tonight for a very special tribute. Earlier this year, we learned that State Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg, one of New Jersey's most influential lawmakers and the highest ranking woman in the state legislature, announced that she would retire after a nearly 30-year career in Trenton. The 85-year-old Bergen County Democrat, a veteran progressive, and a self-proclaimed feisty Jewish grandmother has sponsored substantial laws on everything from gun control and transportation to women's rights and preventing sexual harassment and sexual assault. With our work at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey centered on empowering women, girls, and families, and eliminating racism, and one of our most impactful program being Healing Space, Bergen County's only sexual violence resource center that provides free counseling and support to anyone impacted by sexual violence, the Senator's legislative legacy is closely linked to our values as an organization. She has changed the lives of the people we serve for the better. Upon hearing of her retirement, I started thinking about how do we say thank you for all that the Senator has given us? We already gave her an award at our gala a few years ago, so that really didn't seem to make any sense. Sending her a card and some flowers just didn't seem like enough. So I settled on creating a space where we could share her legacy with our community and a place where we can also make sure that she knows the gratitude that we have for her service and the impact that she has made on our lives. I want to thank some of the people who are closest and nearest and dearest to her for joining me to be part of this tribute this evening. Her colleague and friend, Ms. Janine LaRue of LaRue List Report, Jay Lassiter, political reporter and columnist for New Jersey Insider, and writer, producer, Francine Weinberg Graff, who also happens to be her daughter. I also want to thank our team at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey who helped pull together all the pieces for this tribute show and a few special guests who will surprise us at the end. I would have loved for this tribute to be in person, but we decided that safety was paramount. The upside of doing it virtually is that we get to create a permanent love letter for our beloved Senator that she gets to watch whenever she wants now. And also, you folks get to be part of this great moment as well. As we're doing our conversation and our tribute, you can share your well wishes and thanks in the comments if you have an area where you really appreciated her work or a story that you want to share, we would love for you to write it down so that we can read it and that she can read it. And it's such a wonderful way for us all to be together tonight. Before we begin, I wanna tell you a little bit about our state senator, Loretta Weinberg. She was elected to the New Jersey State Senate District 37 in November of 2005. As I shared, she is currently the Senate Majority Leader and also serves on the Senate Judiciary Committee. She is the Vice Chair of the Legislative Oversight Committee and the Co-Chair of the Select Legislative Committee investigating Bridgegate. She also sits on the New Jersey Israel Commission, New Jersey Historical Commission, and the State Legislative Services Commission. She has been appointed by the Chief Justice of New Jersey Supreme Court to an ad hoc committee to look at domestic violence and the court system. Yeah. Senator Weinberg was the first person to run as a Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor in the state of New Jersey. Prior to joining the state Senate, she served in the New Jersey General Assembly for 14 years. In 2004, after 10 years of work, Senator Weinberg's point eight legislation, which lowers the legal alcohol level to point eight in New Jersey, was signed into law. She sponsored the New Jersey Smoke-Free Air Act, which prohibits smoking in indoor public spaces and workplaces. She also sponsored legislation that overhauled the jury selection process, 
required health insurance companies to pay for at least 48 hours of hospital care for new mothers and their babies, created the Governor's Advisory Board, um, on a Council on Adolescent Pregnancy, and shaped landmark autism research funding that gives $1 from every New Jersey traffic violation to autism research, which is projected to yield $20 million towards autism research within five years. Senator Weinberg has sponsored numerous gun violence prevention measures. She was the prime sponsor of the 2002 Child Proof Handgun Law, designed to help spur the development of personalized handgun technology. Senator Weinberg is the prime sponsor of the legislation to enhance protections for domestic violence victims by restricting access to firearms by offenders. She has also sponsored legislation to reduce the legal maximum capacity of ammunition magazines in New Jersey to 10 rounds. Senator Weinberg has been the lead on every LGBT advancement in New Jersey throughout her legislative career, including marriage equality, transgender equality, and sweeping anti-discrimination and anti-hate crimes law. She has also been instrumental in expanding awareness and aphasia, introducing a bill to designate June as Aphasia Month in New Jersey, and sponsoring mm -hmm. legislation that formed an Aphasia Study Commission. In April 2018, a groundbreaking bill she worked on with Senator Diane Allen was signed into law. Governor Phil Murphy signed into law the Diane B. Allen Equal Pay Act, which amends the New Jersey law against discrimination to provide enhanced equal pay protections for New Jersey employees. Throughout her career in public service, Senator Weinberg has devoted many hours to her community and to local, statewide, and national organizations that seek to improve the lives of men, women, and children. She married her late husband, Erwin Weinberg, in 1961, and they had two children, Daniel, born in 1962, and Francine, born in 1963. The senator now has two grandchildren, Shana Iris, born in 2003, and Jonah Benjamin, born in 2005. In addition to welcoming our beloved senator this evening, I would also like to introduce our guests who are helping me put together this wonderful tribute for her. Let me start by welcoming Janine LaRue. She is the founder of the LaRue List Report and senior vice president of the Kaufman Zeta Group. Janine is a true change agent with a 40-year career that has included policy, governmental, and political positions throughout the state of New Jersey. She joined the Kaufman Zeta Group in 2011 after retiring from Rutgers University as Vice President of Public Affairs. Janine has been a longtime champion of issues affecting women and children. She convened the first ever statewide women's summit in 1992 and continues to be involved in organizing this event to this day. I would also like to welcome Jay Lassiter, award-winning journalist, political reporter, and columnist for Insider New Jersey. And I would like to welcome Francine Weinberg Graf, who has worked as a writer and producer on many unscripted television shows, written for Sh uh, Shonda Rhimes, Lena Dunham, and the King's Center inaugural Social Justice in America magazine. She recently completed a documentary about her amazing mother, Senator Weinberg. Um, you can follow Francine on Twitter at Francine Graf and her film titled The Girl in the Back Room at the Girl at Girl in the BR. We'll have all these links so that you can connect to Francine, to Jay, and to Janine in our comments. And I want to thank them all for joining us today.
So thank you everyone for joining us. We're so thrilled to be able to have this tribute this evening for the Senator. And I, I wanna thank the Senator for trusting me. Um, I sent her an email a few weeks ago um, uh, after I had heard that she was retiring. And um, it was important for me to do something special to honor her. It was also important for me though, to take this moment to inspire others. Um, there's so much in her story. Uh, there's so much um, in, in her journey that for people of all ages, um, you know, to learn from. And I, I thought this was such a great opportunity to not only celebrate her, but learn from her and, um, and do that with a little bit of help from her friends and family um, who we've pulled together today. So thanks for everyone um, helping make that vision happen. And I, and I also want to share, this was also important to me, a little Little backstory fact is um, in my uh, past, a few lifetimes ago, when I was a legislative aide for Senator Byron Baer, um, there was a certain um, a person who was the chief of staff for um, Ben Mazur at the time. And uh, our offices communicated a lot back and forth. And so that was when I first met the Senator in, in a different capacity and over the years have watched her um, rise and change and move and, and just continue to be a force and, um, you know, have always been so impacted um, about so many things. But one of the things I think that I'm always, that really I take is how you say so much, but you say it so quietly. <laughs> Your voice always stays, you know, very um, steady and there's not, you know, um, and I, I really always am, am marvel in that. But with that, let's jump into some questions um, for you, Senator, and we're going to go back and forth with all of our panel here. Um, so when you were a young woman growing up, I mean, I feel like these are the obvious questions I have to ask for our viewers because people want to know. I think people want to know these things. Um, when you were a young woman growing up and, you know, it was during a time when opportunities, especially around activism and politics, just were not always encouraged for women. So what inspired you to earn a degree in history and in political science during the late 50s and then carve a strong and steady path for yourself um, in, in the political arena? Well, first of all, I have confessed in recent years that one of my first role models was a comic strip character. Brenda Starr, Girl Reporter. I don't know how many of you might remember that com comic strip, but she was beautiful with wild red hair and uh, she was a journalist. And that looked to me like such an exciting uh, career to go after. Uh, so I, I laugh at myself that my first role model came out of a comic strip. But you know, Helen, I didn't plot most of this out. Uh, I graduated college in the late 50s, did a little traveling, ended up back in New York and uh, actually ended up marrying the boy next door in Manhattan. That's a story unto itself. And we very early in our marriage and with two little babies moved to Teaneck, New Jersey in 1964. It was a time of activism in everything. The civil rights uh, undertaking, the, the women's rights, the anti-war movement. So all of this was going on right in my own community, which was a community of activists. And so I barely unpacked my dishes took the two babies in the carriage, walked down to what was then the main Cedar Lane and joined up with the uh, Lyndon Johnson for president headquarters, which was in the place that is now Noah's Ark Delicatessen, in case anybody's interested in the history. And it was the Johnson Goldwater election and then each of these issues came along, whether it was school integration in, in my own community, and it was the issues themselves that interested me. I never thought that this was going to be a career or a stepping stone or that I'd even be in, in elected 
office. It just kind of happened. And as I said, whenever a door opened, I kind of walked through it. I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think, you know, for so many um, women and for so many people, you know, we feel like that there has to be a, a firm plan and that, a, that there's a straight line. And as we always, you know, it's, it's great to hear, especially from someone who's accomplished so much like you, that there is really you know, not necessarily a, a straight line anywhere, but um, you just kind of instinctually followed where you were led. Yes. Well, I, I've got to, of course, jump in. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> so what my mom doesn't talk about a lot, which is surprising to me, is that her father was very much in local politics too. He was not in elected office, but um, he was involved in sort of the very last vestiges of Tammany Hall in, oh. you know, the late 50s and 19th and early 60s, which a lot of people don't know. And so I always tell people it's in her blood. You know, her father was very cool and, you know, <laughs> good at the game. And I think it's really in her blood. Oh, well, thanks for sharing that. That, that, that's a lot of, that's a, fills in some good backstory um, for sure. <laughs> so the other piece that I, I, when I think about the, 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 the people we serve at the YW is, and we spend a lot of time with our programs like Next Chapter, which is about, you know, helping um, women transition, you know, in, from careers and life journeys. And, you know, very often when women get to a certain age, like their mid fifties, they're not thinking that they can start a whole new trajectory or take on something really big. And, you know, if I've got my watch right and the calendar right, and your mid fifties is when you really started a huge next chapter. Um, I, I think it'd be great for, for folks to hear about, you know, that process that you went through and how you didn't see it as see a barrier or a door close, how you saw a door open and that there was so much more ahead of you. And clearly there was. You, you know, Helena, I, I think that's an interesting thing to put a spotlight on. Uh, when I look at um, the leadership at the federal level at Nancy Pelosi, women very often didn't start their careers in politics until they were in their 50s, whether it was because of uh, issues around childcare, around family, uh, and so on. So I didn't run for office until 1990, first time I ran for office, when one day I kind of said to myself, you know, I have worked for so many other people. I don't even know what light bulb went off in my head but I know what struck me was I've been so disappointed by so many people I worked for. Why don't I just go try it myself? And um, so I ran for local office for the first time. And, and this is something I've only thought about very recently as I've gotten into advanced age, my 70s, 80s that actually my age was sometimes a, uh, an asset. Uh, when I was chosen to uh, run for Lieutenant Governor with John Corzine, I remember there was a distinct sigh of elite relief among the guys because, well, that's great. She'll make a great LG and she's too old to run for governor. Therefore, we don't have to worry about her. And um, so, as I said, it was sort of my age that's helped propel me because there was always this feeling, well, you know, she's not gonna do this, she's too old. And I don't know what gave me the energy. I tell people jokingly, it's time to release vitamin C and a dose of hostility is my recipe. But uh, I've had the, the ability to have the energy to keep this up. But in many ways, from my 50s on to today, age has almost been a friend to me. Uh, it's given me confidence, sometimes takes 50 some odd years, 
for women to develop that kind of confidence, that feeling of really knowing who they are and what they believe. And as I said, with all these guys around me who always felt, well, she's not a threat because of her age. So it was something that I didn't intentionally parlay, but something that I just thought of in hindsight very recently. So sometimes age is an asset. I love that. And for all of everybody watching, make note of that. And, you know, being 52 myself, I love thinking about how, you know, ahead of me that there's so much to come, you know, and that I, I'm, you know, not kind of getting ready to wrap up my career. Um, so I, I, I love hearing that. So Francine, let's bring you in for a, a, a moment here. And, um, you know, I want to ask you, I guess, another obvious question. I know, get in there. <laughs> Uh, probably another obvious question, which I'm sure you get all the time, but I feel like I have to ask, is what is it like being the daughter of a political icon? Um, I think that that's a um, you know, question people probably want to know. But the other piece that I think is really important, and I think about a lot because of our work at the YW, we spend a lot of time trying to inspire women to run for office in some capacity anywhere. Um, but a lot of women who have children, like myself, you know, very often think, you know what, I don't know if I can do this. You know, it, it, it might be too, it might be something that'll neg negatively impact my kids. I won't be able to be a good mother if I, you know, I will, I'll be distracted. I, I won't be able to do either job well. And that it keeps women from running for office. Um, so what, what as, a, as a child, you know, uh, you know, and again, I know that you weren't young, young, you know, at the time, but you, you know, you went through her life as an activist as a child. I'm just, you know, curious to hear from you um, what message you'd have for women that are struggling with that as well. So there's, there's a lot of different phases of our lives. And um, certainly very early on, my mother was also really never around because because she was volunteering in campaigns and um, there were night meetings and lit drops and, you know, we were dragged along. Um, but I want, I, let me boil it down to a couple of things. First of all, my father was sort of the, he was Mr. Mom. I, I always tell people he was the original Mr. Mom. So my dad had an at home business before computers, before cell phones, um, he would he would he designed the interiors of stores, and he just that life suited him really well. He didn't want to go to an office every day. He wanted to have his own schedule. So he was the one who took us to our doctor's appointments, orthodontist. He I played volleyball because uh, my mom refused to let me be a cheerleader. So because she always said, "I want you." on the field playing, not on the sidelines cheering for the boys because I was desperate to be a cheerleader and wear <laughs> these cute little skirts. But anyways, I ended up on the volleyball team and my father would, he, he would come and watch us. He'd be the only person in, as I describe it, in the near empty stands cheering us on. So I think if you have a good network and you have family around and we have very good friends who would come to my dance recitals, who would sew my tutus on because <laughs> my mother can sew if her life depended on it. But um, I want to boil it down to something my mother said in 1998 that, that is part of this film that I'm working on is um, I basically look at her in, in the film and I'm like, you know, you, you basically put your career ahead of your family. What, why would you do that? And she kind of took a minute and she was like, well, it's much more exciting than motherhood. So I think now my kids are seven, almost 17 and 18. And somebody said to me, well, what do you think of that? And I said, well, she's right. You know, she is a hundred percent right. Um, and so I think that there's a lot that gets sacrificed for motherhood and I'm doing a lot of catch up now and there's a lot that gets sacrificed for career. I mean, I'm getting, doing a lot of catch up for career and, um, 
in a lot of ways, my kids don't like me any more than I liked my mother in adolescence <laughs> because I was around more. So I will boil it down to those things. Well, that's great. And you mentioned your film and for our viewers, we'll have the link so that you can get more information about the film and support um, bringing it along because it's definitely something that we want to see. Can we take a quick minute now to talk about it, Francine? Sure. I, you know, I, what was a very surreal experience was in 2013 when, I mean, it really started when, when my mother ran for Lieutenant governor and for the first time she was on really a national stage and she was all over the news because of her age and Obama going to campaign for them. And, um, and then really in 2013, when she was basically responsible along with some very dedicated local reporters and some other people in her party for unearthing the Bridgegate scandal. It was surreal to watch, you know, her on every news channel um, talking about it, watching, you know, everything leading up to it, Christy kind of trying to punch her down. And my mother, you know, sort of, she just, bounces back like one of those doll, you know, those blow up things that you punch down and they just pop right back up. That is my mom. So I really wanted to do a project about, you know, some tell some kind of story. And originally I tried to do more of a Hollywood television show, but again, it, it's impossible. Um, for a variety of reasons. So I just decided I'm going to do a documentary about it because that's what I know how to do. So it is called The Girl in the Back Room. Title may change, but that's what it's called right now because it's really about the girl who broke through the, the boys in the back room. And it talks about some important battles, her battle, um, when she ran for county executive and she was dealing with my father who was very ill, but she just wouldn't give up because she's very competitive. Um, the Lieutenant governor race, the, the very long fight for marriage equality, which is just a really beautiful story yes. in itself. And sort of how a lot of these battles led her to really taking down this guy that nobody could get near nobody could touch this guy. And if it, if really, if it wasn't for my mom, and again, these very dedicated reporters and some other people, John Wisniewski, this would have been a blip. Just, you know, like what we see nationally, it probably would have just flown by. So the film is about um, the events leading up and then sort of her you know, the specific story that I'm telling is, is the things that she did, the steps that she took that finally unearthed this battle. And, and what's so infuriating to even, you know, just putting it together is when they did unearth this battle, th this, this scandal, they, um, my mother tried <laughs> to get a Port Authority reform bill that was passed by both the New York legislature and the New Jersey legislature, bipartisan, and Chris Christie and his BFF, Andrew Cuomo, both vetoed it. And I believe, Mom, you can give an update, but I believe you're still trying to get a Port Authority bill, reform bill across so that what happened before cannot happen again. So it is a also like a real commentary on what a local politician can do. How, what a great effect a local politician can have on their state. And the only thing my mom ever cared about that she told me over and over again is she is the voice for the voiceless. I hear it in my head. She always said it at every stage of our lives. That's all she cared about. She didn't care about getting famous. She never cared about getting, you know, that is all she ever cared about.
Well, being the voice for the voiceless is definitely a, um, you know, the hallmark of uh, your career for sure, Senator. So Janine, um, you and a Senator are never voiceless when you're together. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, you know, one, I, you know, I, I've known you for years, you know, in, separately. Okay. And, yeah. um, and, you know, I think about the two of you actually of being, you know, really similar um, in so many ways. And, but, you know, one of the things that I always really admire is really your friendship and how you cheer each other on. Um, you are each other's supporters and you really seem to have a, a, a genuine bond in a, in, in a world that doesn't seem to have a lot of genuineness attached to it. And you're always cheering each other on, lifting each other up. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm curious about your friendship, how it started, what that friendship has meant to both of you. And, you know, you know, what, what we can learn a little bit, you know, from it in terms of, of how we can lift each other up, because I really see the two of you doing that. And I think that it's something that we so need right now. <laughs> so um, first of all, I, I'm so honored to be um, on this show with the folks who are here on the, uh, in the squares. You know, that's what I've been calling this whole pandemic exercise that we're in the squares. And every last person in the squares, each of you is a person who I absolutely love. I mean, Helen, you know what I feel about you uh, from our days uh, with the Barnabas system. And Jay, you know, he is one of my guys who I just love him because he just, he tells truth to power, speaks it all the time. And then when I got a chance to get this new sister, oh my <laughs> Goodness, I, I just, um, when Loretta got us together, um, well, I'd heard so much about her anyhow, but when we got together in the state house, I just kept staring at her. I'm like, Here she is in the flesh, you know, she really <laughs> exists. And, and, and our kids are so adorable, although I've been watching them grow up before my very eyes. And so, you know, here we are sitting here in the midst of a giant and a legend. And um, people say things that, you know, it's like, oh, there's another cute little cliche, but I'm going to tell you something. And this is uh, maybe Loretta can tell you. I don't remember when I never knew Loretta Weinberg. <laughs> I can't, you know, I looked at the, I looked at the question and, you know, there are some people in my life I can say, oh, we met in 92 or we met. I don't know when the hell Loretta Weinberg and I met each other. All I know is when we did, it really was love at first sight. It really was love at first sight. I, you know, I, I remember working with her on issues when the governor was, uh, Corzine uh, was governor. And I remember as we, I mean, she, she always, he would always say, did you run this by Loretta Weinberg? You know, he would love to like yell at us about things. What does she have to say about this? And we, we were all like, yes, governor, you know, we did reach out to the senator. This, So, um, well, I think, um, were you senator then or were you assembly? Assembly. You were assembly at that time. And then when they were going back and forth, who's going to be the lieutenant governor? And everybody thought, oh, he's going to go with Bono. He's going to go with this. He's going to go with that. You know, he's going to go with Dana Red. And one day he walked in, he said, I'm going with Loretta Weinberg. I'm like, yes. I said, for real, for real. He said, yes. He said, you have a problem with that? I said, no, Governor. I said, I'm just really surprised. I'm so happy. He said, well, she has everything that I need. He said, she, she's wise. She comes from Bergen County. She's older, you know, because, you know, he had his, <laughs> had his little rumors out there too. So we didn't need any little chicky boom boom in there. And so when he said, this is going to be my running mate, Nobody debated that. He was right on. In fact, if it had been inverted, we may have had Governor Weinberg and Lieutenant Governor Corzine. That's how popular she was on the trail. And I'm going to say this and I'll come back in a little later so the other people can have something to say. But what is so special about Loretta Weinberg? The fact that she didn't set out to be a politician. 
She doesn't walk in and try to figure out, you know, you never see Loretta Weinberg walk into a room looking around because that's what politicians do. They're, they're standing there shaking your hand. They're looking over here to see who else might be more important in the room for them. Not Loretta. Loretta walks in the room. People gravitate to her. She doesn't have to walk up to people, by the way. They walk toward her and they begin to talk. And every person, when Loretta talks to you, you are the only person in the room at that moment. So the thing I love about this woman that I'm going to miss about her, her voice in that legislature, she's authentic, authentic. And when you are authentic, you just don't lose. You just don't lose. So she never knew when she was fighting for marriage equality because I had been in the closet for over 20 years at that time. She had no idea. I was the lead lobbyist on that, thanks to Stephen Goldstein. And Loretta never knew the secret I was hiding in, inside of me, why I was fighting so heavy, because I am a lesbian and I didn't feel that I could be free. And she fought, this straight woman fought, she fought for me. She fought for people like me. So when she says that she is the voice for the voiceless, she has no idea who the voiceless even are because I am part of that part of that club. And I'm gonna stop right there because I'm getting choked up and I will not cry on uh, camera. Janine, yeah. um, when we talk about marriage equality and I'm sure Jay will know this, when we had more difficulty with the African-American caucus in the assembly uh, for a whole variety of reasons. It was Janine who was the chief lobbyist, the person who went there and influenced uh, that group of legislators. And just to lighten up, you know, I like to face most things with humor. Uh, I was. I know what she's getting ready to say. <laughs> I was the well, let's recipient hear it. Let's hear of it. an award in my name uh, made by an, an organization that we won't talk about right now. But the next award winner after me was Frank Lautenberg. And then the, the next award winner was Janine LaRue. And I always said, when I looked at these two people that Frank Lautenberg was the only person they could find who was older than I am. And Janine <laughs> LaRue was the only person they could find who was shorter than I am. <laughs> so do you recognize that, madam? Yeah, that is, I have my my own copy at, at home here too. I'll go get it if you don't believe and, me. <laughs> and it was at that event when I got this award, the other thing, Jay, that makes this award so special is that the governor, Corzine, because they said, well, if we honor Janine and the award is named after Loretta, there's no way Corzine is not going to come to the event because they have been trying to get Corzine to the event several years. <laughs> so sure enough, he came. So um, uh, Loretta made the first comment and then the governor was to present this to me. And he just figured he was presenting it to his deputy chief of staff. He had no idea I was gay. So it was at that event. He was the I outed myself to know. <laughs> 500 people in there. So when he got in the car to go back, he asked one of the persons, <laughs> he asked one of the persons in his car, <laughs> are you gay? Because <laughs> he, he had a, a chief of staff who was gay. He found out another guy in the front office was gay. And then he found out I was gay. He was like, are you gay too? <laughs> that, was, that was such a wonderful night. <laughs> but, that is, but that is true. That's something we've all laughed about since then. But I have to add one other thing. <laughs> Somebody who's still with us, Hazel Gluck who oh, was yeah. a, a member of Christine Todd Whitman's cabinet, who at one point when we were doing some marriage equality press release, press conference, she came out. Everybody knew she was gay, but she never really publicly said it. She came out to, the, to this press conference with this great bravado with, and 
I am gay. And everybody like looked at her. Oh, okay. <laughs> Big yawn. Like, <laughs> exactly. <"What>? Already. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, so mad that funny, nobody was shocked. <laughs> yeah, funny moments as people thought they were, you know, divulging some great secret yeah. that most people knew. It, I mean, it hardly caused a flutter in the room. It was, okay, thank you, Hazel. Next. <laughs> that was funny. No. You know, I, I have to think, though, I mean, I mean, th there's so many pieces of legislation over the course of your history that, um, you know, we're so grateful that you put in place. But clearly, this is one of them. I mean, this this is hey, let, let, let me say something there, because my daughter played a very large role. <clears throat> my granddaughter was 18 years old last month in September, a uh, month and a half ago. And at the moment of her birth, I was meeting in my office with the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and I used to say, and the whatever coalition. Literally, when we got the call from the delivery room that Shana had been born, and we put, it, put her, of course, on speakerphone and heard the baby cry for the first time, I did what any self-respecting grandmother would do. I cried too. And they all applauded in the background. So I have written this story for Shana. I wrote it for her when she was quite young, hoping that when she was old enough to appreciate it, she would read what her grandmother was doing at the precise moment of her birth. And it was not knitting a blanket. It was helping to take a tiny step forward to create domestic partnership in the state of New Jersey. And another warm moment that came out of that was Bab Sipperstein was part of that meeting. And she, I only, I mean, I knew that she was trans and, but I only knew her as a woman. And she came and she put her arm around me and said, I'm a grandfather, you know. At which point, wow. I also learned to say whatever, <laughs> uh, because her uh, original, her older children and her grandchildren had known her in her prior life. She subsequently had grandchildren who only knew her as a grandmother. Mm -hmm. So she had these like two distinct parts of her life, but I will always remember that moment when she put her arm around me and said, I'm a grandfather. So I shared probably one of the most joyous moments in my life with this whole coalition. And so they became, you know, kind of emblematic for me of, um, of that very important event. And thank you, Francine and John. <laughs> for providing that. <laughs> uh, so that, that moment was shared with all of the people in that coalition. And domestic partnership, as Jay knows, was really a very tiny step forward. It was hardly earth-shaking in terms of what it meant for the uh, community. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, so yeah. uh, you were all part of these warm moments in my life, whether I shared laughter with Janine LaRue with picturing the governor going to his driver and saying, are you gay? <laughs> or giving her an award because she was shorter than I am. And uh, it's the place where great friendships have grown. And um, Anything I can do to encourage the Janine LaRue's and the Helens of the world, hopefully for as long as I can, I'll be around to do it with a little leftover for Jay Lassiter. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I love that. Well, I, I'm, I'm always listening. And I, I have to say, I, I um, you know, it makes me wonder, what does Shana think of that story now? 
as a 17 year old, you know, I, I texted, I actually texted, I, I messaged Francine because I had watched the, the, the piece from her film a while ago, but I watched it again today because she had sent it to me as we were prepping for this. And afterwards I sent it, I said to her, wow, your mom is a badass. I, I liked, I, you know, after watching that clip, the way to, sorry, I can say that. Right. Anyway, but I, I, you know, I, I, I that. she's, she's just on a zoom meeting, but I can ask her when she comes yeah. out. But I will say, um, you know, have like sort of tracking this in the film. What is very interesting is she, my mother says at the moment of her birth, but then she she goes on to say, my granddaughter's five years old, you know, and hopefully when she's old enough, and she goes on to say that marriage equality will, you know, be passed. My granddaughter's eight years old. My granddaughter's just fourteen years old. So you get a sense of how how long it it took, and and I I know I wanted I wanted to say one last thing about the 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 story of marriage equality, which really should have its own documentary. From my mom's point of view, from I mean, not to speak for her, but sort of telling this story is the the understanding of the pain that these families were going through mm -hmm. who had been together for so many years and who could not have access to what heterosexual couples had it made like it just was it made no sense and people were not standing up for for same sex couples and families you know, my mother was, um, <laughs> Shana, you're, in the, you're in the background. They, you know what? They have a question for you. <laughs> oh, you are you still with Katie? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. She's almost done. So, so she, I mean, it, it's, it's very emotional for me to even think about now how she really was a voice for same sex couples, same sex families. You know why? Because somebody has a Bible that they think to, I mean, it doesn't even make any sense that anybody should have a say over anybody's life like that. But to really understand, she, my mother was absolutely determined. This was never going to be an issue that she would ever give up. And she did not care what the public thought. She didn't go with any trend. Um, if anything, she's a trendsetter, but she did not care about, um, you know, what, what anybody thought of her. And, and it was not a very popular, it was not a very popular thing to be fighting for when, you know, when she started fighting for this, it was not popular at all. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, the, um, her determination and, you know, her sticking to this that brought us to the point where we were able to, you know, realize this here in New Jersey brings us to her power, <laughs> which brings us to bringing Jay into the conversation. Um, and, you know, Jay, of course, feel free to jump in at any point because I, I, I can see your eyes tweaking at times when people are talking and I'm sure in terms of, of the conversation. But Obviously, you know, we know you as an award winning writer and you've been focused on New Jersey politics for so many years with, with your work with Insider New Jersey. Um, so my question for you is, uh, we, you know, we're, we, we all wait to see the power lists that come out. I know Janine's almost on every one of them right now, <laughs> of course, but we were always waiting to see the power lists that come out. But am I wrong? Is 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 the senator the only one that there's a powerless named after? Loretta Weinberg is a trendsetter in many ways, as her daughter pointed out. I'm a beneficiary of those trendsetting habits of hers. Okay. And as for her power list, um, where she highlights 100 influential, politically influential women in New Jersey politics, um, I'm sure that was a direct result of um, the long history of New Jersey being an overwhelmingly male um, world, male dominated world where most of the important people are male. Most of the important um, uh, chairmanships are, are, are all for, for men. 
it's just basically lopsided. There's a huge gender imbalance in Trenton, which we all know about. And honestly, I think if more men were like Irving Weinberg, there would be a lot more women in New Jersey politics and in yeah. politics in general. So I'm really glad I got a chance to listen to that anecdote about Loretta talking about her late husband, uh, because it sounds like um, that that's so instrumental. We've been asking why aren't there more women in politics for so long? You know, it takes the 110% support of the partner. And most men just aren't willing to do that yeah. still. So um, when I think about Loretta's power list where she pays tribute to a hundred politically influential voices in New Jersey politics, female voices, that was a direct result of there being nobody else amplifying these voices and these names. And, um, you know, if you are using the same criteria every year for these kinds of lists, and it's still coming up like 80 and 90% men, then sometimes you just have to put your thumb on the scale to get a different result. I think it's okay to do that. Yeah. And, you know, the people that Loretta is highlighting, you know, she's not pulling, you know, anonymous names out of the closet. These are people who are, are very credibly could be on any power list, um, but just never really got the recognition because a lot of times, uh, you know, men are a lot more aggressive about promoting themselves about these things. You know, you'd be surprised how, you know, they'll be like, I wrote my tribute. Here's my headshot, you know, which is something that I think a lot of women are very surprised to learn. Um, you know, boys are socialized to be this way and maybe it's, it's different. You know, there are gender roles which, which play into all of this. But as far as Loretta's powerless, um, I saw how much that meant to these women. You know, I, I, I've been on these lists before and I know how important it is. And sometimes you think it's, you know, these are all sort of superficial and, and these are all very subjective, but they really are meaningful to people. And I've seen firsthand what it means to people to be on Loretta's list. And that's just one example, you know, of the power and the influence that she has is that, um, you know, she saw a void, she stepped up, she did something about it. You know, she didn't, you know, whine or make anybody feel badly. She just, she just saw something that was missing and she did it herself. And I certainly hope that this is something that will continue, even though she's moving to a different phase of, of her life in retirement from, from elected office. Yes. Yeah. And Senator, I have to tell you, you know, you were so kind to add me to your power list a few years ago. And I, I have to tell you, as you know, with all the work that, you know, we've been, you know, I've been trying to support that you've been leading and I've been supporting with around the um, atrocities at the Edmund Mahan Women's Correctional Facility. And, you know, I had gotten a phone call um, a few months ago is, is, and talking about, you know, more that was happening and, and how terrible it was. And I sat to myself on, it was a Thursday afternoon, I'll never forget. And I said to myself, I'm on, I'm on the Senator's power list. I should be able to do something to stop this. What, what, what can I do? I mean, I sat in my kitchen by myself and had this whole dialogue in my head. And I said, I'm having a press conference. I'm bringing together people so we can talk about it. And we did. I had that conversation with myself on Thursday, which was totally hyped up because of being on your power list. And by Tuesday morning, we had a press conference and a few days later, we had some movement. So um, I, I actually agree that, you know, just being, you know, being given that opportunity does lift, you know, us up and empower us for sure. It's, so it's very, do. very frustrating. And it's very, it, it, it frustrated me and it made me feel very insecure when I was at a point in my life where I didn't really feel like I had a voice. I didn't have a credible voice on issues that I was really passionate about. And we talk about Loretta being, you know, a guardian of the voiceless, you know, sticking up, you know, I, I wasn't exactly voiceless, but I was kind of struggling to sort of find, you know, my point of view, to find my voice. So, you know, where am I going to be coming from in my political career? You know, am I going to be this like unfiltered sort of fearless guy? Well, you know, that's, that's hard. And in the beginning, Loretta was really, super encouraging you know i was a young blogger at blue jersey um you know not many of us had much of a of a background in politics but we had issues that we were really passionate about and you know blogs were really new and people paid a lot more attention to us than probably we deserved and and i struggled with you know what am i doing here you know we're we were the gate crashers and in those dark moments of doubt when you're asking yourself do you really belong here is your voice a credible one? Are people gonna listen and care about your words and what you say? 
And I'll never, I'll never, I can never remember a time when Loretta wasn't there, you know, firing me up and empowering me and telling me to keep pushing. And, you know, until you can kind of stand on your own two feet and be, you know, secure on your own two feet, you need people to support you and to encourage you and to help you on those days where you're not sure whether you really belong. And Loretta Weinberg always made me feel like I belonged. And that that's an empowering thing. And everybody, everybody deserves that. Everybody in life deserves somebody like Loretta Weinberg in their life. And, you know, that's why I'm so grateful to, you know, have the opportunity to actually say that to her, you know, while she's still vital and while she's still around to, you know, to still be a part of this important ongoing conversation. Well, thank you. I, I want to add to what Jay said, because what, what it boils down to Helen is leadership. This woman is an innate, just born leader. Um, even that list, because Loretta was not happy. She went through the power list. She was counting how many, she wasn't counting how many women were on the list. She was counting how many women weren't on the list. She, you know, she was like, and this person could have been on the list and that person could have been on the list. And the next thing I know, get this thing in the email. She had her own list, but you know what? People, I, I have a, a minister who say to me, you know, LaRue, if people call themselves a leader and they're walking down the street and they look back and there's nobody behind them. They're not leading. They're just taking a walk. Mm. Well, people can make up all the lists they want, but it's like, who's going to publish it? It took a woke blog website to say, Loretta Weinberg has a list of women which she says are the most 100 powerful women in the state of New Jersey. We better post it. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is great. We got our own list that year. In my wildest dreams, I never thought that it would be an annual list. Now here's the kicker. She retires from the legislature this year. Loretta Weinberg is gonna have a list next year. That <laughs> list is still going to be coming up every year until she can't do a list anymore. And who knows, we might, after she says, well, I'm done with this, we might do our own list and just call it the letter, the Loretta Weinberg list. Well, uh, for, first of all, Janine and Jay, thank you very much for all those comments. Uh, and, and I do have to thank Max Pizarro, you know, a white guy from Insider, this started out in the old politicker days when the first power list was published in politicker. And the first thing I did was count down from the top. And I think I got down to like number 38 or something before I found a woman's name. And uh, our list, we do not put elected, statewide elected officials on the list on the basis that they get many accolades in many other areas. So they're all women who are the lobbyists and the writers and the influencers. And there's my granddaughter there, Hello. holding my great granddaughter. <laughs> That's Tiana, Tiana, who also has a place of honor in our family. And Shana, I have told this story of your birth that I know you know and have heard many times and hopefully have read what I wrote. Um, and Shana was 18 on September 12th. So uh, there you have it. I think Helen had a question for you, Shana. Yeah, I was just wondering what it's like to read that um, and think about, you know, your day, you know, your day of birth of what your grandmother was doing. And then as your mom reflected how, you know, as she was going through the journey of, of bringing that legislation forward, she was also, you, you were growing up and you were almost like the milestone marker, <laughs> you know, as a, a for its evolution. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes forget how um, lucky I am and that most people don't grow up with a grandma who's 
in politics and and not just in politics but you know has done as many amazing things as my grandma so it's always kind of shocking um to remember like oh my goodness not only is this her life but it's also my life um like just the other day we were talking about in my economics class not even my government class about um the New Jersey race and the governor race. And not only was it um, the governor race, but it was also my grandma's last term in office. So yeah, it's just crazy to think about how um, all of the amazing things that my grandma has done have also intersected with my life so much. Yeah, I think sometimes I forget is all I can say. And She was bat mitzvahed on the, uh, what, the first anniversary of Bridgegate, Shana, was it? I don't know. Uh, uh, be because she began out her bat mitzvah speech with a year ago, there was a traffic jam on the George Washington Bridge, <laughs> if you remember correctly. That, so that was even woven into her bat mitzvah speech. <laughs> which took, when I heard that first sentence, I must admit that took me aback a little bit. So a lot of this has really been intertwined in Shana's life through just the way things worked out. Yeah, I mean, it really is like woven into my life, like into who I am. And I got very lucky, I have to say. Well, Shane, I have to tell you, and I have to tell your grandmother that I've started a tradition in my house that I'm stealing from her. I know she lets you eat ice cream for breakfast on the day that you leave. And so I've instituted ice cream for special occasions with my eight-year-old twins. Um, after watching this for years, um, as your grandmother has shared it, I, I think it's a great tradition. <laughs> that That's gotten almost more comments on Facebook <laughs> as uh uh, Jay, when uh, Shana and her brother Jonah are visiting me from California on their last morning with me, they get ice cream for breakfast. Uh, Jonah always orders mint chocolate chip and claims he gets his greens that way <laughs> to keep his diet balanced. So uh, this has become now a Facebook tradition and various other families have adopted versions of ice cream for breakfast. I love it. Well, she's, your, your grandmother is definitely known for good policy. So how could I not adopt it? <laughs> I, I want to um, add something that you had asked. What, what was some of the most memorable things that we had yeah. um, about Loretta? And the most hands down memorable thing that I will ever remember about this woman um, when we meet, we normally meet down in the Trenton area or at an event. So she said, why don't you come up to my office and you can get to see my office and come meet me in my office. So I'm thinking, okay, uh, my car will find its way all the way to Bergen County. It won't be too bad. So I get there and I'm, you know, normally I'm running right at the clock, but I'm a little early. I walk in. Deb said, well, you may have just a little wait today, said, because she's she's got a lot of phone calls coming in here today. So I'm looking at the clock. It's 10 minutes late, 20 minutes late. Deb's now, do you want some coffee? It's 40 minutes late. And I'm like, this is not like the senator. So finally, she comes up for air. She opens the door. She said, come in, come in. I got to tell you something. She said, you know, it was this traffic jam of the George Washington Bridge about three days ago, four days ago. And people actually think that someone caused the traffic jam and it had something to do with the mayor. She said, Janine, people are paranoid, but that's a little overboard. <laughs> and then the next week, I'm looking at her on Rachel Maddow talking about the traffic jam that somebody had actually, it was so funny because that day she was like, there's no way in the world anybody's actually just going to blow up a bridge. Actually, it was the Monday after Thanksgiving. I was in California. I'm usually there for Thanksgiving. 
And I usually wait to fly home on like Tuesday so I don't get involved in all that Thanksgiving traffic. And I'm, the kids had gone back to school that day and I'm sitting at the kitchen table. And of course I pull up the hearing that John Wisniewski is holding. And there is Bill Baroni spending hours talking about the traffic study and the, the lanes that come only from Fort Lee. And I thought there's some kind of lanes just for Fort Lee. How come I don't know about it? And I actually called Mark Sokolich from the kitchen in California. And I said to him, do you have some private roads that go from Fort Lee over the bridge? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. So I said, I think you better turn on the hearing. And so I knew from that moment that this was all a made up story. Mm. So, um, as I said, I, and, and there I was sitting in the kitchen right behind where Shana is right now, listening to all of this. After That's when the bell day. went off with you. That's when the <laughs> I, bell went off. I flew home on Tuesday. Yeah. That's and the crazy. next thing I was at a Port Authority meeting. So <laughs> a lot of it emanates with whatever was going on in California at the moment. So Ginny, thank you for sharing that story. Jay, do you have a story? What is what is what's your favorite story that uh, kind of sticks in your mind about the senator? Well, you know, <clears throat> talk, talking about Bridgegate, it's funny because you know I, I, <clears throat> I'm remembering when Loretta pulled me aside at the state house and she told me that she thought that Bill Baroni was full of BS because suddenly, <laughs> you know, they were no he no longer was addressing. Um, Loretta by her first name, which was, you know, they were old friends, but suddenly Loretta became Senator Weinberg. Mm -hmm. So when Bill showed up and was like all formal about it, Loretta like basically sniffed that out a mile away. And I remember she's like, keep an eye on that, which I did. It, the rest is history. But um, <clears throat> I'm glad that people are sharing a lot of political memories of, of, of Senator Weinberg, the legend, because there are a lot, but I remember one out on the campaign trail in 09, which was probably just, it was a very casual exchange between us, which was actually kind of life-changing because um, you really never know what's gonna happen in life. And sometimes you get that little nugget of advice. And if you're lucky enough to, you should take it. And I remember it was 09 and she was down in Burlington County um, on the campaign trail, campaigning for Lieutenant Governor. And it was, an event which we were also promoting mammograms. And there were quite a few women who were there who were in the middle of battling cancer and you could tell they looked very sick. And, you know, to them, this was, you know, really exciting and empowering, you know, in between their treatments to come out and actually fight for, for their politics. And I remember saying to Loretta something, you know, my mom had, had battled breast cancer a few times when I was a much younger man, when I was an unreliable young man and I wasn't really there for her in a meaningful way at that time. And, you know, how much it meant to my, to me that my mom was so tough and so resilient to sort of overcome this, this disease. And, you know, when you're surrounded by women with breast cancer, you get a little emotional, you get a little introspective. And Loretta looked at me and she's like, well, have you ever told this to your mother? And I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was a casual conversation. So it wasn't meant to be profound or meaningful or anything like that. But I do remember having the opportunity to talk to my mom about that as, you know, a little bit of an older man, you know, what it meant to me, you know, for her to go through something like that when I was not really, you know, and I was basically kind of checked out, you know, it was a really bad point for me in my life. And my mom and I had an opportunity to talk about that in a really meaningful way. And she died unexpectedly just a few months later. And it was um, unrelated to her breast cancer. And you know, it was Loretta and I were on the campaign trail in, in the autumn of 09. My mother was gone the following February. In those intervening few months, you know, I had the opportunity to be just a little bit more dialed in to my mother, to this relationship, you know, as, as a grown up, really. You know, I was 35 or 36. And so it was an opportunity for me to really kind of pay closer attention to those things that maybe I had neglected up until that point. And to also tell my mom before it was too late because we didn't realize that we didn't have a whole lot of time left. And even though my mom died shortly thereafter, you know, my dad was around for a whole lot more, 
for another decade. And so this lesson was something that I took into that relationship with him too. So just a little casual suggestion that, you know, articulate that feeling, you know, tell somebody what they mean to you, tell somebody you love them, you know, tell them when something is important to you, because you, you might not have, I would regret not doing this. So that's something that I remember from the campaign of 09. And it really made a huge difference in my ability to kind of, you know, relate to my parents in a more meaningful and grown up way. And I really treasure that. Wow. That's very, very touching. Thank you for sharing that, Jay. Um, you know, I, I think Jay and Janine and Shana would probably agree. You know, when I think about Senator Weinberg, I think about her as being our New Jersey's version of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> um, she's kind of like our New Jersey treasure <laughs> in that same way. Um, and, and I think about, you know, I watched that, you know, I've seen so many documentaries about um, about her and, you know, the way she talks about her husband as well. There's so many similarities, you know, I feel like about the stories, their stories and their lives. Um, and, and I also think about an opportunity I had to speak with Gloria Steinem and a question that I got to ask her. And it's a question I want to ask the senator and curious for the others to, to, to share as well. Because um, I think about it with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and I think about it with Gloria Steinem and I think about it with you, Senator. And I think it's one of those, your answer, I'm hoping that those that are watching will, will take with them and, and you know, help help inspire us and um, with the impact is that, you know, you've had so many ups and downs and low points, right? That you've had to get through to get to the wins. And, and the wins were big, but as you shared, it took almost a, like, you know, a good portion of your granddaughter's lifetime for one of them. So they, it was a marathon, it was not a sprint. There were a lot of ups and downs. Um, how do you keep going through those tough times and not give up? And, and how do you do that when it's so public? I mean, everyone's watching, you're in the newspaper, you're in the news, you're everywhere, but um, you, you, you've kept going. Uh, you know, you didn't, you know, you, you didn't check out um, during the hard times and some of the times were very hard. <laughs> because I actually had a passionate belief in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I know that's hard for some people in politics to fathom. And I used to say on occasion, I wish I could, there was an, an, an antidote <laughs> mm -hmm. that I could take and kind of get over it. And uh, yes, there've been many ups and downs and the, now I'm going to cry. The years of my husband's illness is taught me so much. First taught me about insurance companies and how you wend your way through that bureaucracy. And it taught me, it, it, it was, uh, I think Francine talked about how I felt about committed couples when we were in the marriage equality fight. And it was talking to people who had been together for 20 and 30 years, who when one partner got ill, could not walk into the hospital room because they weren't recognized as the marriage partner. I, and, and I knew I could always walk into my husband's hospital room. I could make decisions. I could talk to his doctors. And when I heard from, as I say, committed couples who've been together for years, who were denied that simple ability of, on behalf of their loved one, it was something I really understood. So the ups and downs always hopefully gave me a lesson mm. for what needed to be improved or somehow worked on or set right, uh, uh, whatever it was. And, and Jay, I remember when we finally got domestic partnership passed 
And um, there was a big celebration. It was at the Maplewood uh, Town Hall. And I was invited to come and say a few words. And I don't know how many people were there, but it looked to me like there were a thousand people present on that lawn. And I stood there and I thought to myself, because I knew it was really such a tiny step forward. I had, what I said to myself is I have never done so little that made so many people so happy mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I got it. And I understood it was the first breakthrough um, and we couldn't even call it civil unions, let alone marriage. And uh, even when we fought the civil union battle, when I tried to get the word spouse into the law rather than civil unionized partner or whatever that kind of crazy euphemism. Uh, so it took us a long time to get to the word marriage. And so, as I said, it was maybe just that a whole juxtaposition of knowing what it meant for me to be able to care for my husband without anybody questioning it, that I was able to translate that to the other couples that told me stories like that. And um, so it's, it was life's lessons, whether they were good, positive, like Shana's birth, or the sadder ones that actually spurred me on. So give me a minute now. <laughs> well, I'll let you have a minute. And I, I thank you for sharing that because I do think, you know, we all need a little inspiration about how to get through the tough times. And that's a great way and a great lesson to be able to take is just to step back and learn from them. And um, so thank you. So we'll give the Senator a minute. There's a little lightning round question to kind of uh, close up our discussion and, and, and our tribute a moment is- um, Were you gonna say something, Shana? Oh, or Shana, please. Just a second, sorry. I just um, wanted to say really quickly that I am gonna write one of my college application essays basically about that question um, because of how I've watched my grandma, you know, win some, lose some. Mm -hmm. because of how it has affected me. Um, I ran for a few positions in my mock uh, government program that I do and lost. And my grandma basically told me almost the same exact thing that she just told you guys. So I just wanted you to know how straight from her heart that was and how important um, it was to me. Yes. Well, thank you, you for sharing. Find out that you never really lose. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, when when I ran with John Corzine and lost, Shana's brother Jonas said to me, "But Grandma, you came in second. <laughs> you know, he was used to getting a trophy for coming in second. <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> that gave me my first big laugh of the evening <laughs> when Jonah pointed out that I <clears throat> that John Corzine and I came in second. Okay. I love that. <laughs> Francine, thank you for sharing your box with your daughter. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys one more story because I guess um, we can, and then it can be, um, oops, what did I just do? Okay. Um, then, then we can go to, and because we can be on a lighter note. Um, so the other story I have is that I was also desperate to be in the Little Miss America contest that <laughs> ran at Palisades Amusement Park for any of you who have been in the Bergen County area in those years. And I would cry every single year because my mother refused to let me be enter in the contest. And um, I blame her. <laughs> To this day, I'm still like, why didn't you just let me be in the contest? But she used to say, I'm not going to let you be judged by a bunch of, well, you say men, but it was probably a bunch of moms would be my guess. But, um, but that was our other story. And, and um, 
I was so desperate and cried so much every year that one of my relatives had to get me a tiara and I always have to bring it out for these occasions because <laughs> it's a little worn for the wear, but it is still. You won. Miss America. Thing, you won. In the end. <laughs> But to this right. day, I blame my mother for not letting me be in the Little Miss America contest. <laughs> well, I, I have to tell my daughter that I'm in good company because I, I, she um, was the only girl in her class that didn't become a cheerleader because I had the same conversation with her that your mother had with you almost verbatim. So I feel even better knowing I'm going to tell her that Senator Weinberg feels the same way. <laughs> well, I tried to get I tried to get my daughter to be a cheerleader and she was like, Pfft. <laughs> it, I don't think it's what it used to be and <laughs> not this it doesn't hold the same cachet right <laughs> so a little lightning round to to close out of uh just you know off the top of your head thoughts what's the legacy Jay what's the what's the legacy that uh, Senator Weinberg as she's leaving this chapter of her life I know there's more to come I know we're not done you know with uh with her impact but this this chapter Loretta Weinberg's legacy has been and remains um, fearlessly sticking up for people who are on the margins and fighting for wildly stigmatized and unpopular causes. And sometimes the causes she fights for get kind of popular at the end, like marriage equality, that was kind of a cool thing at the end. And then other things that she fights for, like protecting IV drug users from bloodborne diseases by getting them clean syringes, I don't think that's ever gonna be popular. So my advice is jump on her bandwagon because what she's fighting for is probably going to be the law in 10 or 12 years from now. That's great. Thank you. That's great, Jay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Janine, what about you? I go back to what I always tell other people when they ask me about Loretta, she's authentic. And the fact that she is authentic and continues to fight to be the voice for the voiceless. She takes on those tough issues that most people talk about, you know, behind closed doors, but they don't really want to come out and really poke their heads out like reproductive freedom. She believes in it. She believes in the whole nine yards, not just the fact that we have the right, but we have the access to health care. So one thing of relief for me about Loretta's exit uh, as an elected official is that I know that most people who run politics are not elected. So now she can move on to that other tier and mm. do what the boys do, make those decisions, bring people to the table. She can do, call the shots who should run for various districts. We are going to be expecting really, really big things out of Loretta. And I was reading on, um, uh, I'm sorry, Jay, New Jersey Globe today, that's about okay. a woman down in Monmouth County who is a uh, commissioner, used to be a freeholder, but she's a commissioner and she's 80 some years old and she already has scheduled her uh, fundraiser for her reelection <laughs> in 2023. And then there's a mayor down there who <laughs> in his late 90s and he's already talking about his reelection and when he's, when he's up for reelection, he's gonna be 101. So you know what, Loretta? You're still a babe. You got a whole <laughs> lot of work to do, and we are going to work you until the wheels come off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let, let me say I've made a few compromises along the way. It's not always, you know, wonderful and pure uh, because, uh, and I know I think I've probably even been criticized by Jay in some column or another in the, in the past. But, um, you, you know, you need to get to 21 votes in the Senate and 41 votes in the Assembly in order to get somebody on the, that governor's one vote desk who has the signing pen. So uh, any compromise I've made, sometimes uh, not, not happily, but because I always thought that there was a greater good at the other end or that I couldn't take on every single battle that came down the road. 
you know, I could hear my husband's voice. He always just to say to me, do you have to get involved in every single battle that's going on here? And um, sometimes even after he'd passed away, I'd say in my, my own way, they didn't know I was sitting on the floor of the legislature communicating with my husband who had passed on. Sometimes when I push that speak button, I look up and say, I'm sorry, Erwin, but... <laughs> I get involved in this one. <laughs> get involved in another one. <laughs> so uh, as I said, I also have to confess, I sometimes was conversing with my husband who had passed on just before I pushed the uh, speak button. So he was a great source of support to me. So there are a lot of white guys in my uh, past and present who have been helpful and my first mentor was Jeremiah F. O'Connor, who was in the old days, as they called him, a freeholder director, who every time I came up with an idea said to me, go for it. And um, so, and we talked about the women's power list. Hopefully I gave the appropriate thank you to Max Pizarro, who not only welcomed it, when I approached him with the idea, but always set up the graphics and help make it look more important than the way it came out of my computer. Um, and then there's Jay Lassiter is another one of those white guys who helps move the needle forward. So uh, even though I spend a lot of time denigrating white guys in my daily speech and as um, Janine knows she and I, along with a few of our compatriots, do it quite regularly. There are some who have helped me get to where I am, and I appreciate that. And the compromises, I, I want to point out, I've no, I've, when you are in the inside, you can't always be the purest that you can be on the outside. So, um, just a lesson to others who get involved, pick your battles, make sure they're important and make sure you're willing to see them through from beginning to end. Mm. Very Sage. Much. Yes, very much so. So well, Helen, thank you so much for doing this. You did bring me to tears. You gave me a chance to see my daughter whom I love dearly, even though we kid each other. And she doesn't remember that I actually stayed home with them for five years. She has no memory of that whatsoever, <laughs> but it did happen. And uh, it, giving me a chance to at least see one half of my two favorite people, my two grandchildren. Where is Jonah? Hey, Jonah, can you come here? <laughs> so. <laughs> Give him some time too. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm so I'm so grateful that it, it worked out that we could all be together. I just wanted to say, like I said, I, I, I felt sorry that we couldn't be together in person. But one of the positives of being able to do this virtually is we get to have this on tape and and watch it over and over again for for the moments of inspiration, for the laughter, the tears, all of it. Um, you know, clearly you've touched everyone on this screen and everyone watching and um, we're so grateful for you. And um, we'll have a little surprise at the end here. But with that, I just want to thank you all for being here. And Senator, thank you for sharing. Thank you to Jay. Thank you to Janine. Thank you to Francine. Special guest appearances by Shane and Jonah, which was a wonderful surprise. And um, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. All the best. Thanks, Helen. Thank you so much, Helen. Getting to know and serving alongside with the Senate Majority Leader, Loretta Weinberg, has been a personal and professional goal and honor of mine. Um, as a young contract lobbyist in Trenton, seeing uh, a woman who has fought so viciously for what she believes in with women's rights and LGBTQIA plus rights as well, it's really inspirational to see that she's not only willing to play politics, but really to play a game. And it's really just inspirational to serve alongside her and call her my friend. Thank you so much. My name is Julie Raginski, and it's been my honor to know Loretta Weinberg for over two decades.
Let me tell you, there is no more formidable, determined legislator and political operative in New Jersey. Loretta, you have been a mentor and an inspiration for countless women. Thanks to you, anyone who's in love can get married. Thanks to you, survivors of sexual assault cannot be ignored. Thanks to you, the most disenfranchised among us can seek justice. Thanks to you, predators in the workplace are no longer protected because survivors are forced to stay silent about workplace toxicity. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service. Thank you for your mentorship. And most of all, thank you for your friendship, not just on my own behalf, but on behalf of the people of the state and the rest of the nation for whom you have paved the way. Loretta, congratulations on tonight's honor with the YWCA. Personally, you mean so much to me. The advancements for all of New Jersey's LGBTQ rights, you have paved the way and kicked the door open. And our community is forever grateful to you. And we want to wish you well in your retirement. And thank you for championing all the important social justice causes that you have fought for during your career. You are a true, true warrior and a great friend, role model, and leader. God bless and enjoy the retirement. There's no such thing as farewell to Senator Loretta Weinberg. She's paved the way for so many of us and has had such a great impact on all lives. Her tenure as a Democratic leader in the state of New Jersey speaks for itself. I'll never forget the advice she's given me over the years. Senator Weinberg is a staple in the world of politics, but more importantly, she's a pillar of support for women all over this country. I'm proud to know her and wish her a very happy and healthy retirement. Hi, Loretta. I'm Ida Miller Silverstein. As a longtime life member and now co-president of National Council of Jewish Women Bergen County Section and a lifelong resident of Teaneck, New Jersey, I am honored to join the voices celebrating your over 30 years of service and accomplishment for the state of New Jersey and the people of District 37. We are proud that so many of the bills that you introduced and issues you championed were espoused by National Council of Jewish Women locally and nationally. We take great pride in recognizing that some years ago, you chose to join our ranks as a life member. It has been our great fortune that you have, over the years, moderated many of our advocacy programs, linked us to compelling speakers, answered our questions about bills on the floor, and even jumped in at the last minute when a speaker canceled. In 1995, we recognized your triumphs, your devotion, and achievements by honor it, honoring you with our most prestigious award, the Hannah G. Solomon Award. In 2016, you sponsored a joint resolution to commemorate the birth of Hannah G. Solomon, January 14th. She was our founder, establishing Hannah G. Solomon Day as a day of observance and education in the state of New Jersey. I and many others of our members have fond memories of advocating with you on Teaneck issues. And we know that in your retirement, you will continue to champion the needs of our local and state residents. We wish you continued success in all that you pursue. Congratulations, Nana, we, we love you. you. <laughs> Many thanks to our guests for joining me this evening so we could pay tribute to our beloved Senator. And I'm so grateful that she could be with us and hear how much she has impacted our lives and allow us to be able to learn and be inspired from all she has done. This has been an unforgettable memory and moment for all of us. I just wanna remind you all that you can be part of supporting the Senator's legacy by helping um, support the film, The Girl in the Back Room, that has been created by the Senator's daughter, Francine Weinberg Graff. Um, again, we have the links here um, for you uh, in the comments and it's a great opportunity for you to connect watch a piece of the film and also learn how you could help make this film um, get out there so everyone can see it it's such a, a, a wonderful way to pay tribute to the senator um, sure you could um, you know do that in lots of ways but one of the I think wonderful um, ways that we can support 
um, is by you know bringing this film out to the public. Um, well, before we close though, I just want to um, share a little surprise that we pulled together for the Senator. Um, over this time, as you know, uh, YWCA of Northern New Jersey has a, a show, YWTV, and uh, we interview and speak with so many leaders and uh, wonderful uh, uh, people connected to organizations and um, you know change agents in our community. So we asked a few of them to join us in um, sharing um, in this celebration, this tribute. And so we have a, a, a little closing piece for you um, that highlights uh, some of those special messages with some a very, very special one at the end, um, again, for our beloved Senator. Um, Senator, as I said, thank you just doesn't seem enough, but we can't wait to see your next chapter. We know that there's so much more for you to do and um, you've inspired us to uh, realize that, you know, it's never too late and we can all be making a positive impact in our community just like you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.